we're aware of the destructive nature of fire in the world around us. It can destroy lives and objects in seconds or be harnessed to produce energy and materials that are useful for a variety of applications. But in whatever role it appears, fire is always respected. In this lesson, we'll discuss the figure of fire and how God uses it in the scriptures. We recognize fire physically as a rapid release of energy known as combustion. This happens when a fuel is combined with a source of ignition to bring this about. There are few forces in nature that are as feared or as useful to mankind. As we turn to the scriptures, we see that fire is used as a figurative element and is employed in a variety of ways. As was true of our study of water, Fire appears throughout the scriptures and many times appears within the context of God's authority or represents the Lord in specific ways. In this study, we'll take a look at fire in God's presence, fire in purification, and fire in judgment. As we examine each of these areas, I'll make note of additional functions that fire performs within each of them. Let's take a look at these in detail. In the Bible, there are instances in which God makes himself known to various individuals and employs a variety of methods to do this. One that stands out and is recognized by many is the use of fire as a symbol of God's presence and power. Some of these events are more obscure to most people since they haven't been the subject of movies or other stories, but their presence in the scriptures is significant. When we think of the presence of God, we may envision a dramatic spectacle, such as the Hebrews saw at Sinai, which we'll talk about in a little while, but there are other events that are more subtle. One of those appears early in the narrative as God renews and emphasizes the promises he's made to Abraham. Abraham, originally from Ur of the Chaldees, was called upon by God to leave his home and family and go to a land the Lord would show him in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. A three-part promise was made to Abraham, or Abram as he's known at the beginning of the story. In the future, his offspring would become a great nation that would eventually bless all families of the earth. He would have a son, Genesis 17:15, and his seed would inherit the land that God would show him in Genesis 15:18. These promises are restated several times and can be summarized as the seed promise referring to his son and future offspring the land promise, and the blessing of all families of the earth through him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left his home to go to the land God would show him. Throughout his life, Abraham trusted God and never doubted the promises made, but as he grew older, he asked God on several occasions when he would have the son the Lord promised. As God spoke to Abraham in a vision, the patriarch expressed concern over his household. Abraham stated, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Genesis 15, 2 through 3. God assured him that Eliezer wouldn't be his heir, then directed him to look to the sky, stating that his seed would be as numerous as the stars in Genesis 15:5. God then restated his promise that the land he saw would be inherited by his offspring. Abraham then asked, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Genesis 15, 8. God told Abram, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Genesis 15, 9. And arrange the animals in pieces. Some of the animals were divided and laid out, but the birds were not. Then, about sundown, God caused a deep sleep to come over Abram, which is described as a horror of great darkness in Genesis 15, 10 through 12. In this state, Abraham heard God restate the promises that had been made earlier, followed by the image of a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that moved between the pieces in Genesis 15, 17. God wasn't just making a promise to the patriarch. He was demonstrating his commitment through a solemn oath. God added details to the statements previously made as well. These included the fact that his seed would be strangers in a strange land where they would be afflicted. In the fourth generation, God would bring them back to this land where Abraham was. 
the nation that had afflicted Abraham's offspring would be judged by God, and the land to be given to Abraham's children extended from the Euphrates River to the river of Egypt. In this episode, God used the image of a burning lamp along with the smoking furnace to signify his power and as a seal of the covenant the Lord made with Abraham. The combined images emphasized the solemn nature of the promises that were being made and God's assurance that they would be fulfilled. Fire also plays a role in the events surrounding the call of Moses to lead the Hebrews out of bondage. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Exodus 3, 1 through 2. The presence of God was represented by a flame of fire, which didn't consume the bush. In the message which follows, we see the promises of God restated, as well as other declarations of his power. God tells Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know of their sorrows, Exodus 3, 7. God confirms that the time for Abraham's seed to be delivered from their bondage had come and explains, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey in Exodus 3, 8. God's power and presence are represented in this episode by the fact that he's aware of the plight of the Hebrews. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them in Exodus 3, 9. God then issues a command to Moses, which consolidates elements of his promises, power, and his word, accompanied by the manifestation of the burning bush. God states, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, in Exodus 3.10. The fulfillment of the promise to Abraham was set in motion as the Lord called Moses to act as the physical agent by which he would perform his work in Egypt. These representations also reveal that God's presence, power, knowledge, and intent act on behalf of the spiritual welfare of his people. The fire serves to characterize God as a powerful being who deserves reverence. God's appearance in the burning bush is intended to impress upon Moses that his power is sufficient to accomplish his will, and he encourages him to be bold in the task ahead. God states, Certainly I will be with thee in Exodus 3.12. The absolute nature of God's power is declared as he pronounces that deliverance will be accomplished and states, When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain in Exodus 3.12. As the Hebrews left Egypt, God gave the people a visible reminder that he was with them that included fire. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Exodus 13, 21 through 22. This column of cloud and fire not only signified the presence of God, but provided protection as well. This is demonstrated as the children of Israel fled from the Egyptians and were able to cross the Red Sea on dry land. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Exodus 14, 19 through 20. This impassable boundary exemplified God's power and provision for his people and incorporated fire that protected and gave guidance. At Sinai, God's presence is represented by fire in a powerful display as he issues a law to Moses. This law embodied the authority of the Lord and created a framework by which the Hebrews were to live. In preparation for the Lord's appearance, Moses directed the people to wash their clothes and set up boundaries as God was to appear to them on the third day in Exodus 19, 10 through 11. Anyone who touched the mountain would die. So barriers were set up to prevent this in Exodus 19, 12 through 13. 
The description of God's appearance at Sinai is one of great power and glory. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a great furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. Exodus 19, 16 through 18. God's descent on the mountain was accompanied by thunders, lightnings, and fire in the sight of the people who were gathered in his presence. This set the stage and impressed on the people the majesty of the Lord and his power. The law that was then given to Moses would govern and guide them as they moved forward to establish the nation God promised Abraham would one day bless all the families of the earth. God made a covenant with the people that also underscored their importance in God's sight. God told Moses to tell the people, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus 19.5 The physical manifestation of God wasn't just a display of power and authority. It was also meant to remind them that his presence would be with them. God called upon the nation to be a special people in the earth in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. By keeping the law, they would be blessed as long as they remembered and kept his word. The combination of these elements reinforced for them and for those who study the scriptures the nature of God, including his goodness, mercy, and power, as demonstrated in these events for the benefit of the Hebrews and later all nations. The fiery appearance of God would live in their memories and would be passed on to their children for generations. This event marks a transition in the narrative from the patriarchal dispensation to the Mosaic. Although the text focuses on the children of Israel and they were given a written law, God continued to act in other ways as well. During this period, we see the Lord acting through agents such as angels, the prophets, and later in more figurative ways, such as visions and dreams that pointed to the future. We can see that prophetic language, dreams, and visions sent by God had similar characteristics that identified God as the originator. In visions recorded by the prophets, we find imagery that parallels the events at Sinai, the call of Moses, and the vision that Abraham was given. In the writing of the prophets, these visions embody the word of God, and the representations serve to identify God by acting as his autograph on each of them. Examples of this can be found throughout the writings of the prophets. Ezekiel's writings contain similar elements that describe God and incorporate images of fire, denoting the power and majesty of the Lord. Describing the figurative appearance of God, Ezekiel gives a rendering of the power and glory of the Lord as he records his vision of God on his throne. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne, as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Ezekiel 1, 26-28 God's presence, power, and glory are represented here with the image of fire and brightness. The images link this vision with God by means of the comparisons to the accomplishment of God's promises, such as the bow, reminiscent of the token of God's promise to never destroy the earth with water again. God's power and authority is manifested to Ezekiel in the representation of a throne, implying God's role as a king or ruler, Ezekiel 1.26. In Ezekiel's vision, we can note that not only does fire appear as a symbol of God's majesty and power, but it's accompanied by similar elements. We see the appearance of fire, Ezekiel 1.27. This is accompanied by the appearance of sapphire and amber in Ezekiel 1, 26 and 27, 
and the appearance of a rainbow and its brightness, Ezekiel 128. Fire appears in Ezekiel's vision, creating an image of the Lord's power. The brightness of the fire represents the glory of the Lord, as Ezekiel stated in Ezekiel 128. We can compare similarities in Ezekiel's vision and description of God's presence with what both Moses and Abraham saw, which points to a common source. In Ezekiel's writing, the terms appearance and likeness and the phrase, as it were, tells us that this was a symbolic vision, not a literal manifestation given to the prophet. While this appears to the prophet in a vision, this image of power and majesty is more than a decorative element. God states the reason for this vision, telling Ezekiel, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, even unto this very day, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Ezekiel 2, 3, and 7. As was noted in the occurrences of this representation to Abraham and Moses, the overall context involves the word of God revealed to the prophet, which he was to deliver to the people. Part of the nation had been taken into captivity at this time, and the remainder in Judah continued to sin against the Lord. Through Ezekiel, God called upon the people to consider their ways and repent. The mercy of God is shown later in the book when God states, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Ezekiel 18:23. God's authority over his people had been set aside as the nation served idols and corrupted themselves. God, in his continued care for them, delivered this message through the writing of Ezekiel that the Israelites should repent and live. Similar to the vision of Ezekiel, is John's vision recorded in the book of Revelation, describing both God and Christ in similar terms. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4, 1 through 3 and 5. Notice the similarities in John's writing, the vision of Ezekiel, and events at Mount Sinai. The context of Revelation establishes the spiritual significance of these images. These things were revealed by the Holy Spirit, Revelation 1.10. The book was written to show things that were to shortly come to pass in Revelation 1.1. The seven churches of Asia are addressed, exhorted, edified, and rebuked in some cases by Christ in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Finally, John writes of the things that must shortly come to pass in Revelation 4-21 through and closes the book with a warning not to alter the commands of God or the vision that was recorded in Revelation 22. Images of the lamps of fire, the throne, and the content of what is stated reveals that the book represents the will of God delivered through the Spirit and is for all Christians who may overcome any adversity through their faith in Christ. The similarity in how these elements are presented once more points to a common source, which is God. Purification by fire in the scriptures is perhaps more subtle and is closely intertwined with the presence of God, judgment, and sanctification. There are two ways in which purification is accomplished with fire. One of these is the destruction of corruption, both symbolically and physically. To destroy impurity in something purifies what is left. Another way in which fire is used figuratively in the scriptures has to do with the idea of tempering or hardening in much the same way as metals would be hardened for use. Leviticus, the priest's instruction manual, provides directions for offering sacrifices to God. Burnt offerings in Leviticus chapters 1 and 2, peace offerings in Leviticus 3, offerings for sins of ignorance in Leviticus 4, and trespass offerings in Leviticus 5 through 6 involved burning the sacrificial animal and usually taking the ashes away from the camp to a designated clean place to dispose of them in Leviticus 6.11. Previous discussions of the sacrifices show that these were representations of Christ, 
and the removal of the ashes had to be performed exactly as God directed. Offering the animals in this way demonstrated the faithfulness of the Hebrews to the law, ensuring the continued favor of the Lord and his blessings on their nation. There are other sacrifices that were burned as well. A discussion of the sacrifices would be a lengthy study in itself, so these are mentioned as examples. An exception to the removal of ashes and their disposal outside the camp is that of the red heifer, whose ashes were used for purification in Numbers 19, 1 through 9 and Hebrews 9, 13. In the New Testament, we have examples of fire used in a figurative sense, referring to trial and the effect it has on the life of the faithful. Peter deals with this in his first epistle. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 Satan seeks to destroy those who follow God. 1 Peter 5, 8 And trials that come upon those living a godly life present challenges which, if overcome, makes the believer stronger. Peter compares this to a refining process when he states that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 1, seven. The image in this passage brings out the idea that impurities in one's life are purged, just as fire destroys impurities in metals such as gold. This, in turn, helps strengthen our resolve to be faithful to God and prepared for a positive outcome in judgment. God's judgment against evil is represented in the scriptures in both physical and figurative images. One of the most well-known stories in the Bible is that of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham negotiated with God to spare the cities if ten righteous souls could be found. Lot, Abraham's nephew, had settled in Sodom selecting the area because it was well-watered and would support his herds and flocks in Genesis 13.10. When these few righteous souls couldn't be found, God rendered his judgment against the city. Angels sent by God took Lot, his wife, and two daughters out of the city with instructions to flee to the mountains in Genesis 19.17. Lot asked for permission to go to the nearby city of Zoar fearing that he couldn't make it in time in Genesis 19, 20-22. Once the family reached the safety of Zoar, God rained fire and brimstone on the area in Genesis 19, 23-25. The destructive force and finality of God's action left a permanent reminder of the severity of his judgment. Prior to the destruction, the area was described as well-watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord in Genesis 13.10. The scriptures noted that the destruction included those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground in Genesis 19.25. The city of Sodom is believed to have been in the vicinity of the Dead Sea and today is a desert area that remains barren. The New Testament reinforces the need to respect God and his commands. Paul states, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. 2 Corinthians 5, 10-11 Paul, in his letter to the Romans, adds to this warning, stating, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Romans 11:22. Nadab and Abihu, two of Aaron's sons, were consecrated as priests, but failed in their duties in what is another of the Bible's better known stories. God instructed Moses to gather spices for making incense in Exodus 25, 6, and detailed instructions on how the incense was to be burned where and by whom. God specifically stated, You shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon in Exodus 30 and verse 9. The tabernacle was set up, and the tribes brought their offerings for it during the twelve days of dedication in Numbers 7. 
Aaron and his sons were consecrated as priests at this time in Exodus 40, 1 through 16, and Numbers 3, 2 through 3, and were to remain in the tabernacle for seven days ministering before the Lord, Exodus 29, 35. Nadab and Abihu ignored the instructions given to them by Moses and violated the sanctity of their duties. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Leviticus 10, 2 through 3, and Numbers 3, 4. God's judgment was immediate and destructive. Nadab and Abihu had no reason to change the nature of their duties. God warned them about this, and for their negligence, they lost their lives. This emphasizes that God's instructions are precise and must be followed exactly as they've been given. God explains the sudden and complete destruction of the two, which Moses relayed to Aaron, stating, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified in Leviticus 10.3. God also told Moses and Aaron they weren't to mourn for Nadab and Abihu, but were to continue with their consecration and allow the people to mourn in Leviticus 10, 6 through 7. When God's reasons were explained to Aaron, the scriptures tell us that he held his peace in Leviticus 10, 3. There are multiple problems with the actions of Nadab and Abihu. They altered God's commands, changing the conditions of the service they rendered. Although the change may have seemed inconsequential from a human perspective, God didn't take it that way. The Lord of the universe has the right to instruct and expect his commands to be followed. The alteration the brothers made was disrespectful to the Lord and could possibly influence the entire congregation had something not been done. This was also the outset of the formal worship in a structure designed and detailed by God. No human had the right to deviate from anything, no matter how small it seemed. Some of the harshest consequences have come upon humans when they thought they had the right to change what God has spoken. Nadab and Abihu found out the hard way what it meant to sin and incur the wrath of God. Fire was the element that displayed God's power and displeasure with the actions of the newly appointed priests. His judgment was destructive, immediate, and without doubt as to its origin. The judgment of God is demonstrated again with fire coming from heaven in the challenge between the prophet Elijah and 450 prophets of Baal. The king of Israel, Ahab, is described as being more evil than any of the kings preceding him in 1 Kings 16.30. To add to his own evil, Ahab married a foreigner, Jezebel, who introduced Baal worship to Israel in 1 Kings 16.31. Jezebel's evil was compounded by the fact that she sought out the prophets of God and killed them in 1 Kings 18.13. The influence of this evil was such that prophets of Baal defied the power of God. Eventually, Elijah challenged them to meet him at Mount Carmel to offer sacrifices to their respective gods. Elijah stated, And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. 1 Kings 18, 24. Sure of success, the prophets of Baal, along with 400 prophets that kept sacred groves, gathered at the mountain to show whose God was the only deity. Sacrifices were prepared, altars built, and wood laid out in readiness for the true God to demonstrate their power by fire. The prophets of Baal went first and spent the greater part of the day calling on their God. This included shouting, cutting themselves, and leaping on their altar at one point, among other things, in 1 Kings 18, 26 through 29. As the day wore on, Elijah taunted the idolatrous priests suggesting that their God was asleep, on a journey, or simply couldn't hear them in 1 Kings 18.27. As the time of the evening sacrifice drew near, it was obvious there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded in 1 Kings 18.29. Elijah then repaired the altar of the Lord, called the people to him, prepared the sacrifice, and directed them to pour four barrels of water over the altar and sacrifice. This was repeated three times until the water soaked the wood, the sacrifice, and filled a trench Elijah made around the altar in 1 Kings 18, 32 through 35. Elijah then called on the Lord, saying, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, 
let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. 1 Kings 18, 36-37 Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. 1 Kings 18, 38-39 The manifestation of God's power was immediate, completely consuming the sacrifice, proving that there was no God but him. The judgment of the Lord was unmistakable in this event, and the prophets of Baal were killed in 1 Kings 18.40, according to God's decree in the law that idolatry was forbidden. Exodus 20 and verse 4, Leviticus 19.4, 26.1, and 26.30. This event wasn't a simple competition between rival belief systems. God called on the Hebrews to be a special people among the nations honoring him in preparation for the time when the Messiah would come into the world in Exodus 19, 5-6. God's judgment may be linked to his word through the element of fire. The word of God contains his commands, power, authority, and ultimately his right to execute sanctions. God placed his words in Jeremiah the prophet's mouth, indicating the divine origin of the message in Jeremiah 1, 9-10. God told Jeremiah, because ye speak this word, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would. Jeremiah 5, 14. The figurative aspect of this expression describes the nature of God's judgment against the nation of Judah and others to whom Jeremiah spoke. God is described as a consuming fire in Deuteronomy 4, 24 and Hebrews 12, 29. Due to the nature of his commands and authority manifested in the verdict he renders against those who practice sin. God had been set aside, his law forgotten, and his image as a true God corrupted by false prophets. In his rebuke of these, God tells Jeremiah, I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord? And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets. Jeremiah 23. 25 through 30. The Lord, through his word, renders judgment and is a consuming fire. The writer of Hebrews urges Christians to respect the Lord when he states, Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. God's word has been delivered. Jude 3 and contains those things which will make one acceptable to God, 2 Peter 1.3. It's by the word of God that the world will be judged. Peter states, But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, 2 Peter 3.7. Christ will be the judge sent to render the verdict against the world at the time chosen by God in Matthew 24.36. Paul states, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9 In this, God's ultimate power and authority over all things will be realized through the judgment carried out by his Son, Jesus Christ, and will be accompanied by fire. The appearance of fire in the scriptures shows that God utilizes elements with which we are familiar to demonstrate his power, authority, and provisions for mankind. Fire shows that the judgment of God against those that don't obey will be powerful and final in its destructiveness. 
God, however, has left us the means through his word to escape these consequences, have a spiritually fulfilling life here on earth, and live eternally with him. In the next lesson, we'll explore how the order and arrangement of the physical universe mirrors spiritual truths. Join me in the next video for a discussion of God and the elements.